Welcome to AARP, Arizona Hispanic Connection. Educate. Celebrate. Connect. Arizona Hispanic Connection. What is our history? What is our past? What is the claim that we have to be members of this society? We are not here to threaten or to beg. We are here to participate. You cannot close your eyes and your ears to us any longer because we are here. Most people are saying Spanish, the Mexicans, indigenous peoples do not have the special inheritance of liberty that we have. My father thought that the United States would be like paradise. There was jobs for everyone. There were thousands of people trying to get across. The toughest part was when I left my mom, not knowing if I'm going to see her again. Here's a man who's shed his blood, and yet he can't get something to eat. Reckless, yes. Dangerous, extremely. Uh, did it pay off? Damn right. The first European language spoken in what would become the United States, Spanish. Immigration means it all gets to be part of your identity. I can't believe it! It's crucial that we know who we are, where we come from, and what it's been like. I am so proud to be your mayor. I, Sonia Sotomayor. There's so much at stake for all Americans in how Latinos in the United States do. We are here to participate. Very strong words from Henry Cisneros. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Alex Juarez, uh, live from 1190 AM and also on our Facebook page, AARP, Arizona Hispanic Connection. Good morning, David. How are you? Wow. I, I Those words are very, very touching, uh, Alex, and everyone is, is just powerful words. We're going to do our very best to uh, talk a little bit about hi the history of Latino Americans. And it's just unbelievable. We have a great guest today, and uh, it, this is going to be a good show. I, I am so excited uh, for today's show, David. Uh, we have Frank Barrios, historian here in Phoenix, uh, Arizona, knows the history of Latinos in, in, in Arizona. Al Kiwi is also a historian, uh, book writer uh, in Arizona. Dan Martinez as well. He's uh, our volunteer state president. Uh, James Garcia as well from the Arizona Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and uh, very well known in the, the community. So thank you so much for being here today. So this is our second show, David. And uh, last week was basically just a kickoff for our show, Airs, um, uh, AARP Arizona Hispanic Connection. And we basically just talked about the different platforms that we're going to be talking about, uh, history, the health, uh, education, you name it, different platforms. Yes. Uh, today, we're going to focus more on history, but before we go deep into the history of Latinos in the United States to begin with, um, and thanks to the, the PBS series, uh, you put it on Facebook, um, you provided the, the link so we can watch the episodes. It, it, by the way, it's absolutely amazing. Um, wanted to thank two people in, in particular. Uh, first one is uh, a local artist by the name of David Murrieta, David Murrieta uh, from Tolleson, that is helping us put together our mural, the mural basically that will depict the the branding of this show, uh, the history of Latinos, some of the icons, uh, both landscapes and also figures like um, Governor Castro, uh, like um, a Congressman Pastor, Chapito, Chapito as well. Chavarria. Chavarria, that's right, exactly. He will be in that mural. Uh, landscapes like uh, South Mountain, uh, we have the Westward Ho. Um, in, in general, it's going Did to be. Did you mention Post 41? Uh, Post 41, that's right. Legion Post <laughs> of 41 course. is included for our veterans. Says that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's right. Definitely. So yeah, this mural is going up on 7th Street. Uh, right in between Portland and Roosevelt, right next to a famous restaurant there. I'm not going to say the name for it, obvious reasons, but um, it's uh, right off uh, south of uh, the I-10. We will be having an, an unveiling and basically a community painting day on Saturday, May 27th. So I want to invite everyone to participate to come and help us finish the mural. Saturday, May 27th, 9.45 a.m., 
9.45 to 12, to noon, uh, we will allow people to come and help the artists finish off the mural. It'll be just a, basically... It's going to be a fun of... event, actually. Oh, it's gonna you be know, a We're going to get to event. paint it and, and, and see it. Uh, this is awesome. Well, th thanks yeah. so much. I mean, uh, you know, we have someone on the line, um, and we're going to go to her in just a bit, but uh, I wanted to say something very, very important. Uh, if we can do two things today in this show, I would consider it a success. And one is to make all of you who are joining this conversation aware of the PBS series Latino Americans. Uh, this is a six-episode series on the history of Latinos. And I, I can just imagine the amount of effort that it took to put this together. Uh, there's a book. Uh, Al, you have I, 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 you brought a book. See, he's got a book. It's Latino Americans. So please, 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 please uh, be, be, be aware that there is that uh, website. It's actually a website. It's, it's, uh, it's pbs.org forward slash Latino Americans. And please know also that it is in English and in Spanish, all six episodes. I've watched this series twice, and I started doing the third time around. I watched the first chapter the third time a couple of times yesterday and the day before. So please, please, please know that. Uh, just so that uh, you uh, get an idea, first chapter is foreigners in their own land, And that's where we got the name for this particular show. I, I think this is an amazing, amazing title. Number two, Empire of Dreams. Number three, War and Peace. Number four, The New Latinos. Number five, Prejudice and Pride. Number six, Pearl and Promise. So we're just going to kind of emphasize chapter one today. And let's see how the time goes. We might land today in Arizona. Because that series does not emphasize, does not give a lot of details on the history of Arizona. But what the problem, right? What, what's the problem? <laughs> We have historians here. Frank Barrios wrote a book. I would like to start with Al because you brought the book, Impressions, about this series, uh, Al. And then maybe we can, we can kind of begin with that. Uh, you know, I'm sure you become, you're aware of this series. And just give us impressions about that. You brought the book, et cetera. And if you can say just a little bit about yourself, too. Yes. Thank you. I'm Al Kiwis, and it's just a pleasure to be here today. I just want to uh, let you know about this book, Latino Americas. It's part of PBS. Uh, it was first shown, I think, about uh, a year or two ago. And they went out to different parts of the country showing different segments. And I was able to see one of the segments. And I just realized how powerful this was. Uh, I made a point to watch it on PBS. I wasn't able to see each one of the, the series, but I was able to purchase a book, and the book is very informative, and they have some incredible information here that uh, will make you really proud to, to be a Latino. And uh, I just want to, again, thank you guys for letting me be here. Al, can you say just a little bit about your family tree? I mean, I, I was overhearing that you go a long way back. Yes, yes. Uh, my aunt on my, uh, my mother's side, uh, which who are twins, uh, they go back. She was able to go back to, with our ancestry to the 1700s here in Arizona. And this 1700s? Is, that, and she wow. did this work before uh, we had Ancestry.com and other, other facilities or other places of research. And so I am really especially proud. And so that really encouraged me to want to know more about my family. And, uh, and then on my father's side, this is really important. Uh, he, his family was uh, from Sonora, Mexico, and they, uh, they were living in this little mining town southeast of Hermosillo, and Pancho Villa comes into town and raids the town, hangs and shoots people, takes their supplies, destroyed the mining equipment, and left them. And so they needed to make this significant change, and that's why... They came here to the States, you know, because of the Mexican Revolution. And, and there's much written about that that's called the push-pull effect. And the push was like from the war. The pull was from the Arizona because at that time there was an incredible amount of need for hardworking people, for skilled people. 
Uh, Roosevelt Dam had just been completed, and they needed to have more people to help out. Perfect. I want to go to Dan. Dan, you and I have talked a lot about your history. If you can uh, 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 grab that mic. And, and, and your family also goes a long ways back in history. And can you share with us uh, what, you know, the, about your family tree and all that? Yes, thank you, David. This is Dan Martinez. Um, we have been very fortunate and blessed to be able to track our family back to Spain in 1457 and all the way forward hmm. um, on my father's side. Basically, they came to Mexico in the early 1500s, started marrying the native women. Uh -huh. So we became uh, part of that culture. Right. Mestizos right away. We didn't stay in Mexico very long. We stayed for two generations, which is probably about 50 years, and moved forward north to New Mexico. Hmm. We crossed the border. It wasn't a border then, but <laughs> right. the present border in 1598. There was an original wow. group of 300 settlers that came. 1598. Yes. This is before Jamestown. Yes. Oh, yeah. Way yes. before. Yes. <laughs> And my dad's family moved to Albuquerque in Santa Fe, and they even established a capital there in Santa Fe in 1612. Oh, wow. Wow. So that's a brief history of how our family came to this part of the world. You know, it, we, we want to take care of breaks, but before we do, I want to go to Frank. If you can grab that mic, Frank. You, all, you wrote a book. You must, uh, inter uh, you must be interested in history. Can you also tell us about your family tree, kind of. Uh, I'd be glad to. Thank you, David. Um, uh, my, the, my mother's side of the family um, is, uh, <clears throat> on my father's side, they came out of the Tecate area, Baja California. But on my mother's side, uh, my family, I haven't done the research that some of the folks here have done, but uh, I go down to about 1870. I find my family was in Santa Ana, Sonora, mm -hmm. and then they moved around a lot. I guess that was uh, they moved into California, into the Phoenix area. They had a ranch in a place called Descanso outside of San Diego in the uh, 1880s. But uh, I find most of the family came out of the Santa Ana, Magdalena area. So of Nora, course. And then they'd move. Again, there were no borders in those days, so they could move around and come into Arizona. California was all part of, uh, of the United States. And, uh, uh, and then, of course, uh, they, they uh, became U.S. citizens after the war with Mexico in 1848. And, um, uh, but, uh, again, one of the reasons I haven't done a lot of... Uh, uh, studies is my great grandfather, my mother's grandfather, was Jesus Martinez, and that's like trying to find John Jones in the United <laughs> States. <laughs> now, you wrote a book uh, about uh, what's the name of the book? It's called The Mexicans in Phoenix uh, right. by Arcadia Publishing. And uh, why don't we show the book, Frank? Let's sure. Here and then, uh, that way, our, our, our friends in Facebook and also on the video yeah. can be. Yeah. Looking at it. So we actually have two books here. Now, who, uh, Al, who wrote Latino uh, Americans? Uh, Ray Suarez. Ray Suarez wrote that book. And then uh, Mexicans in Phoenix was written by Frank Barrios. Now, we know that there's another book uh, by Dr. Santos Vega. He wrote Mexicans in Tempe. Am I correct? That's correct. And Dr. Burrell wrote one on the Mexicans of Scottsdale. Scottsdale. So there's a few books, you know, floating around that, that I, is, is worth noting. I, I also would add I, uh, Dr. Santos Vega and I also did one on the history of Chicanos por la Causa. Okay. Uh, we interviewed viewed the people and put a, a small book together on that on that history and again I, I might emphasize we're we're going way back but Phoenix wasn't founded till 1878 right 20 years after the war with Mexico Phoenix was founded. and we're going to touch the history of, yeah. uh, of Phoenix in more detail uh, we're almost going to go on break just a few seconds James go for it Uh, companion book that was written by Dr. Arturo Rosales from ASU. That is he's right, he's yes. passed away, uh, unfortunately, but N terrific book. Title uh, again? 
Uh, it's called the Chicano Movement. Okay. It was a four-part series that PBS did many years ago. Very good. So, also, so is that a book or a series? Well, there's, it's a companion okay. book to the series. Got it. So it's also. So I like need to. One. I need to research yeah. that one and too. And then quick mention of Ray Suarez, longtime uh, PBS contributor, Definitely. journalist, terrific, yes. so great writer. David, we need to go to break right now. You're listening 1190 AM and our Facebook page. Please uh, follow us and also share it with your friends, please. It's AARP, Arizona Hispanic Connection. Welcome to AARP, Arizona Hispanic Connection. Educate. Celebrate. Connect. Arizona Hispanic Connection. Welcome back. Uh, you're on 1190 AM and also on Facebook uh, through AARP, Arizona Hispanic Connection. I'm Alex Juarez and David Parra. We are your host of uh, this show. And, you know, David, every time I hear that jingle, I get really excited. I love, absolutely love the jingle. <laughs> Sometimes I play it several times during the day. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, we did a great job. But anyway, I want to thank uh, the local artist and producer that did this for us. Uh, he might be Miguel listening. Alonso, yeah. I think he said he was going to listen to the second absolutely. show. Absolutely. You know, he is a fantastic uh, producer. He uh, creates jingles, voiceovers, very well known here in the, uh, the Valley. So, Miguel Alonso, thank you so much for creating this jingle for AARP, Arizona Hispanic Connection. Definitely. You know, we're going to go back uh, to cover some of the key elements of the history of, you know, the Mexican-American War and all those kind of good stuff. But before we do, uh, are we ready to uh, to have Mimi Lozano, uh, Ulises? Is she ready? Okay. We have Mimi Lozano from California. And I, I don't know. I You know, I, I've never met Mimi Lozano, but through a friend... I found uh, a concept called SomosPrimos.com. <clears throat> so I, I, you know, this friend of mine, Jeannie Krieger, Correa Krieger, she's an AARP volunteer. She says, you should uh, get in touch with uh, Mimi Lozano from SomosPrimos.com. And I did. I had an amazing conversation with Mimi. And when she explained to me what Somos Primos is, I said, wait a minute. So remember, we're already giving you two sites that are extremely important, websites. www.pbs.org forward slash Latino Americans. And that'll take you to that uh, series. It's, 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 a, it's actually a platform. You could call it a platform. It's got videos. It's got videos of people telling their story. <clears throat> and guess what? It also has a, 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 a study plan, a curriculum, so that if people want to teach uh, students uh, 7 through 12, it's got a, a, a curriculum that people can follow in teaching our history to our kids, you know? And uh, it is just unbelievable, that website. So we, we strongly recommend it. And also, uh, we just mentioned uh, SomosPrimos.com. And Mimi, are you there? Yes, I'm here. All right. We can hear you perfectly. And I, first of all, I want to thank you so very much for your willingness to join our conversation and to share with us if you can tell us a little bit about yourself and then uh, uh, about this wonderful concept that you develop in, uh, in SomosPrimos.com. Go ahead. Okay. Well, I was born in San Antonio, brought up in East L.A. I got involved in, in wanting to know more about myself and, and my background and my family's background and started doing family history in, uh, I guess it was the early 1980s. Uh, and when I started doing it, I, I realized that there were very few of us uh, doing our research. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Spanish-speaking people were not doing their research very much. That's what was fun to listen to the conversation this morning and hear the books that have been written, you know, by our community. Right. And uh, so that was really fun to see that. Anyway, I, I got in touch with uh, a couple of other people Actually, one other man, Raul Guerra, uh, who was also doing research in this little family history center that I was searching for information. And when I called him up, it turned out he was an engineer mm -hmm. here. And, actually, and, and his background was from San Antonio, 
which was why we were both looking at the same records. So then the, between the two of us, and then we found two other Latinos that were doing their, their genealogy, their history. Mostly their lines were in Aguascalientes, mm-hmm. and, and um, most, most, mostly in that area, Jalisco and, and, and that area. Anyway, the four of us decided that we needed to put together a group that would help each other. So the concept was to network and to help one another. And the, the group first started out uh, with, well, just sending out flyers, you know, sending out flyers, putting them in libraries, putting them, going and talking to people, sending it to other family history centers. The family history center that I'm talking about are the, the family history centers that are uh, there available for the public by the LDS Church, the Mormon Church, where a lot of the research takes place for a lot of us. Anyway, we started this group, and uh, this, uh, we, we wanted to call it something that would show that we were interested in our history and our family history, as well as general history. And we were all Mexican heritage, and we started a group that is, uh, we call it the Society of Hispanic Historical and Ancestral Research, uh-huh. to, show, you know, to show that we're interested in all aspects of our history. Right. And uh, so the group started, um, I think the first meeting that we had was in 86, 1986, and uh, it has become a nonprofit. Uh, it still meets regularly, and the Somos Primos started as kind of a newsletter to get information out, and we started out as an organization which was uh, dues-based, and so we sent out the quarterly that was called Somos Primos, my husband had asked me when we were t- talking about, I was the editor, I have been the editor. Uh, my husband asked me, well, well, you're always saying you're cousins. He says, how do you say you are cousins in Spanish? He's not Spanish speaking. I said, somos primos. And he said, well, why don't you use that? And I thought, God, that's good. <laughs> so that, that's that's, that's, a, that's an excellent name. <laughs> yes, yes, because it really states what we want to say and what we want the the idea that we want to put across that if you have a spanish surname by gosh you're going to go back to spain any way you look at it it may be a thousand years it may be two thousand years but you're going to go back to spain right so that was the concept and then uh the the idea of our organization got bigger we actually had a a club membership of 800 people which got a little unwieldy as far as time spent on the uh, membership and all the paperwork that goes with it, and also printing up a quarterly, and it was an 18-page quarterly, uh, that was a little bit difficult also. Right. We had to have it. I can imagine. Done. Yeah, so it, it was a big thing. So January 2000, I said I was still president at the time. I said, wouldn't it be a good idea if we dropped the dues and just put it online? You know, just wow. and, and put it online. Of course. So, so there was general agreement, and we went ahead and did it. Our numbers increased in terms of the contacts, and the contacts increased, so we were able to get information from more and more people. Right. And this is the diversity that you see on Somos Primos. It's to actually go from here we are in the United States, and we go back to Spain, and where and when did you come in? Did wow. your ancestors come into Mexico? Did they come from Mexico? Did they go directly to Cuba? I mean, where did your ancestors come in? Right. My, my, one of my lines, we're talking about where they go back. One of my lines, my maternal line on, on my grandma's line, okay, they were actually uh, come in from the Canary Islands in mm-hmm. 1731 and helped found San Antonio. Wow. Which is where, later on, I was born. Amazing, you know? amazing. And, I, and I, I didn't know that. I didn't know it until I started actually doing my family history. Right. And, uh, and, and that was the excitement of the discovery, you know, where you discover along the ways what your background is, right. where you come from. Now, Mimi, what can people expect to find uh, on SomosPrimos.com? Okay, well, I always put, first of all, the whole idea is to encourage people to do their family history and to connect with each other. Right. So the ways of the connecting is when people send me an article, whether it's a, a, a book review, like, like the, the gentleman that spoke before, and it's their own research, okay, I always put the email of the person that, that sent that article. Okay. That, that means if you, 
if you're read if you're reading Somos Remus and you find a connection in Arizona or in New Mexico or in California and you see the Spanish surnames that are there, you know, the pedigree information that's there, then you can contact that person. Def now yeah. Mimi, uh, I understand that you also compile a list of uh, chronologically of Latinos who have been successful in both the <clears throat> academically, politically, on in business. Is that the case? Yes, it is. What we're trying to show with some of those primos is that we're here, and you don't even know who we are because we're so diverse. Right. And our background is so diverse. Our education is very diverse. We're not just the newly arrived, but we've been here for 500 years, and you don't even understand that. We're also connected with the indigenous here. I'm, you know, 20% indigenous according to my DNA, okay? I didn't know that until I did the research, and in this case it was DNA. So we're trying to show how diverse and how we're embedded in everything that happened in the United States in the development of the Americas, actually. One wow. of the news projects I'm involved in is, is the Spanish presence in America's roots, and right. we're trying to show the influence of the horses in the development of the United States. If you look at the fact that in the 1512, I believe it was, I, I saw a map that showed all these, in Florida, all these cattle ranches. Now, you don't have cattle without having horses. The horses right. were brought in by our people. You know, our, our ancestors brought them into the Americas, and that's what made the difference in the United States and the development of the Americas. That's our ancestors. Right. So it Mimi, gives you, yeah. Mimi, I want to thank you so very much, and you and I have... A commitment. When you come to Phoenix, please let me know. If I go to uh, the L.A. area, I'll let you know. We have to sit down, and I would like to turn that camera on and really, really uh, offer a op an op open platform so you can tell us more. <clears throat> We want to collect videos and, and showcase yeah. them on our Facebook page and YouTube channel. So thank you. Thank you so very much. Let, let me just say one more thing. Yes, go ahead. It's a so much famous as a volunteer effort. We did, we take no ads. We have no dues. It's free and it's up there and it's an archive. If you go to the you go to the home page, you can go into all the different other information that they can access, like what you're talking about right now. Okay. Definitely, I visited a couple of times, but it is just so rich that it takes a good amount of time to explore all the the good resources and information you have there. Mimi, thanks so much. Thank you. History. Thank you, David. Let's go on a break. We'll be right back. Thank you. Welcome to AARP, Arizona Hispanic Connection. Educate. Celebrate. Connect. Arizona Hispanic Connection. What is our history? What is our past? What is the claim that we have to be members of this society? We are not here to threaten or to beg. We are here to participate. You cannot close your eyes and your ears to us any longer because we are here. Most people are saying Spanish, the Mexicans, indigenous people do not have the special inheritance of liberty that we have. My father thought that the United States would be like paradise. There was jobs for everyone. There were thousands of people trying to get across. The toughest part was when I left my mom, not knowing if I'm going to see her again. Here's a man who's shed his blood, and yet he can't get something to eat. Reckless, yes. Dangerous? Extremely. I did it pay off? Damn right. The first European language spoken in what would become the United States. Spanish. Immigration means it all gets to be part of your identity. I can't believe it! It's crucial that we know who we are, where we come from, and what it's been like. I am so proud to be your mayor. I, Sonia Sotomayor. There's so much at stake for all Americans in how Latinos in the United States do.
This is James Garcia. I just want to thank uh, AARP and Arizona Hispanic Connections for having me on today. It's uh, it's really an honor and, and, and an honor to be in this uh, room with uh, some really uh, important historians locally, Al Kiwis, Frank Varios. Uh, they, they know this community, they know this state. Uh, we heard that cue towards the end about uh, the Spanish language uh, being the first European language uh, that came to this uh, hemisphere. Uh, and, I th- and I think that's a, that's a nice uh, place to just kind of kick off a, a little bit more of a conversation also, too, about uh, the influence of, of Spanish uh, colonialism here in the state uh, and how far it goes back. Al talked about his family history going back to the 1700s. Uh, s- people, uh, amazingly enough, so many people are new to Arizona, uh, that's, that's always news to them, right? When you start to talk to them, they're like, 1700s? Yes, the 1700s, <laughs> just in Arizona, right? And uh, and I've had the honor of visiting um, Mexico City and not just the ruins, uh, but uh, but a house that actually still stands there that Hernán Cortés lived in with Malinche. Uh, they shared that house, uh, and I visited a house uh, on the border near Veracruz, a little small um, house that, frankly, is not maintained that Hernán Cortés built uh, just off the bay in Veracruz that's still barely standing, but there uh, our influence reaches uh, far back. And, uh, and of course, uh, we should never talk about these things uh, without also understanding that we melded uh, with the Indian communities to create this mestizo uh, culture that we all sort of live and breathe now. I certainly do. Uh, so I'd love to hear a little bit more from Alan Frank about just kind of us here in Arizona, too. I, I just would uh, like to make a comment that a good friend of mine whose family goes way back uh, would always say, I never crossed the border, the border crossed me. Sure. <laughs> right. that meaning that they were there and all of a sudden they drew a line on the ground and said, this is now the United States, Mexico is there. And that person's family had been there for uh, hundreds of years at that same location. And many of them are still in the same location. And uh, if you look at, and unfortunately, uh, a lot of that is not mis- under, is not understood, uh, especially if uh, the, so many people from the East think that their history, uh, the, the, and rightfully so, that their history ties with George Washington, the founding of the United States. But here in the Southwest, our history began with the Spanish speaking that came in into this country, and, and most. Uh, the Hispanic Mexican Americans are very proud of that history. Uh, that that we all that we found it the blood of our ancestors that lies in this land, and it's important for us to remember that uh, the history of the East is important too. But our history in the Southwest started with the Spanish coming into this area. Dan, yes, thank you, David. Uh, I just want to mention some sources of information that I think people uh, should be aware of. I think most of us are aware of the the series that was done by Alex Haley called Roots that uh, chronicled the African-American slaves and the African-American uh, experience in the United States. But there is a book uh, written by Via Senor that is titled Reign of Gold, and that describes the experience of Mexican people coming north to the United States, and it's very well done. I think that people should be well aware of that source. Definitely. I would like to us to continue in this way. Let me read one of the quotes from that little, uh, uh, you know, segment that we play. Uh, it says, what is our history? What is our past? And here it is. What is the claim? that we have to be members of this society. What is our claim, right? Yeah, Al, Al, uh, you and I were talking a little bit offline about um, uh, our presence here, even in Arizona, and sort of the two or three major waves that brought us. Uh, Could you talk a little bit about uh, about that? I think that, that to me, cements how long we've been here and why we should be relevant to this community. Yes, thank you. Um, I just... um, it's really important to understand and to know that it was uh, Father Kino. Father Kino came here in the late 1600s, 1700s to start establishing missions in Arizona. And uh, in his time in Arizona, he established three different missions. And any time there was a mission, uh, Spain would build, uh, New Spain would build a presidio around those to protect the people that lived there. And so that's kind of how Arizona got its start. And so 
Father Kino brought people, brought cattle, animals, and he also brought taught uh, Native Americans how to uh, farm, and uh, he was very, very good about that, and that's why uh, people think of him and honor him in the way we have. Uh, from there, uh, um, the, uh, they established Tubac in 1752, and that was really the first uh, European city that we established uh, at that time, and I once 1752. Again, 1752. That is amazing. And, and Tubac, of course, is still thriving. And by the way, uh, Governor O. Castro's daughter now lives in Tubac, so we have historical yeah. connections and so on. Wow. Yeah, exactly. And then uh, from there, uh, it was uh, it was really difficult working with the, the the Native Americans that lived there. I think the Apaches were very a raiding. Uh, tribe at that time and so made it very difficult so a lot of people end up moving towards Tucson and Tucson they established their presidio in 1775 so all of these this is before the declaration of independence so this is really significant amazing yeah so we have like this incredible story there and from there you know Tucson has an incredible story of how they started so that was really the first wave of people that came in you know as a result of that I think the second wave was probably uh, the need for mining, you know, copper. You know, mm-hmm. this is the copper state. Mm-hmm. And at one time, we were like the, the world's largest production of copper. And at that time, at the end of the 1800s, 1900s, there was like a significant need for copper in, in all of technology for building. I think that was like when um, we started having the light bulb, electricity, the telegraph, um, the automobile, you know, all of these different would needed copper. And so our, the next section of Arizona was like through our mines. And so the mines were, you know, like um, the w- different ones that we have here was, I think, with Ajo was a first, uh, Morenci, Globe, Jerome, you know, those are the mines that where people came. And so... And may, may I, Al, uh, say just something quickly about the mines? Uh, yeah, that please. legacy, the legacy of the of the, the work ethic, the unionizing, the, 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 the cultural mix uh, from that period, particularly involving people of Mexican descent, uh, is still lives with us today. Uh, and it's embodied by literally people like um, uh, Paul Luna at, mm-hmm. at the Helios Foundation who came from that area, uh, uh, Congressman Pastor who came from that area, yeah. uh, 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 Mary Rose Wilcox, right? People who, who are achievers who came out of a culture of people who were willing to work hard uh, and, and in a unified way to get it. Those folks are still you know, here in our community uh, and their descendants, and so it's an impact. That's still being felt. That's Definitely. Right. Yeah, exactly. You are listening to 1190 AM, AARP, Arizona Hispanic Connection. Uh, we'd like to invite people to call in if you have a question uh, for Frank Barrios, Al Kiwis, or Dan Martinez, or James uh, Garcia. Please uh, call 602-759-1910. That is 602-759-1910. You can also send us a question via Facebook Live at... AARP Arizona Hispanic Connection or a comment. It could that be a question right. or it could be a comment too. And uh, you wanted to add uh, something else. Yeah, I else just wanted now? to ask. Uh, after the the mining, I think the next big thing where people came in the influx was uh, because of the Mexican Revolutionary mm-hmm. War, yep. and that was in uh, 1912 to 1920. In that time frame, over a million people came from Mexico, and they came into California, Arizona, New Mexico, uh, Texas. And so they were pushed away. And And in Arizona, uh, that was the same time that we became a state. That was the same time that Roosevelt Dam was completed. Roosevelt Dam created this huge opportunity to uh, for water, for electricity. And so they needed to build an infrastructure. And so they needed to build canals, they needed to build uh, electric lines, but it also increased the need for mining and farming and ranching. And so... And Mexican labor in general, right, Al? Exactly. So, mm-hmm. that, you know, people don't know this, but, you know, Arizona was built on the skill, labor, hard work from the Hispanic people that live here. And we don't get credit for that. And so... So, Frank, if you can uh, jump in. Uh, Well, when the railroad was completed in the 
late uh, early 1890s, late 1880s, uh, all of a sudden there was an influx uh, of uh, people from the east, and there was always a, a, a clash of cultures uh, between those that knew nothing of the Hispanic culture and those coming from the east. And the numbers kept rising all of a sudden, uh, like in Phoenix, close to 50% of the population of Phoenix was uh, 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 Mexican, Mexican-Americans, Latino. And then the railroads came in, and all of a sudden the Latinos found themselves being a minority. A minority. And all of a sudden laws were being passed, uh, English-only laws and things like this. And, of course, uh, uh, several groups got together trying to protect the interests of the Latino businesses and so on, such as... Um, uh, well, there was a whole, whole series of them. But also, I, I wanted to just touch, uh, uh, that was a wonderful explanation of the, the waves that came through. But know that the Mexican War with Mexico, uh, the, the area north of the Gila River became part of the United States. And uh, unlike California, New Mexico, and Texas, which had long been established by the Mexicans, north of the Gila River in most of Arizona, there was nothing. That was the land of the Indians. Uh -huh. And the northern boundary of Mexico, not officially because Mexico would claim all of Arizona, but uh, ran from Yuma, Tucson, Tubac, and on through. Because as you went north of the Gila River, the Apaches... The Yavapais, all the other tribes were there, and and like Phoenix, uh, there was uh, the Indians were living here, the Maricopa Pima Indians, but it was founded in 1878, 20 years after the war with Mexico, mm. and and the wow. Mexicans coming in from Mexico, Mexican Americans started moving into Phoenix to develop it, and uh, a large number until the railroads came in, and then then others came in. Yeah, so Frank, lot, uh, lots happening even before. Arizona became a state, well, and well, Arizona, all those happenings yeah. involved the Mexicans who had come from, uh, right. you know, who act, well, some of right, them were already waves. here. That right. Here I mean, right. The, the Mexican American War, uh, for people who haven't gotten enough of an exposure to that story, is it's so, so critical to us as Latino people in the Southwest, of course, because it was a war of conquest, right? Absolutely. And so what happened in Tucson, what happened in Phoenix, uh, was that culture sort of overtaking, if you will. Uh, the the what was then the dominant Latino culture right and and Indian cultures of the region so yeah James let's hold that so, thought we have to go to break right now when we come back we're going to pick it up again on that because that is an extremely topic there very important topic again you're listening to 11:90 a.m. AARP Arizona Hispanic Connection follow us on Facebook Facebook and share it with your friends as well please we will be right back welcome to AARP Arizona Hispanic Connection. Educate. Celebrate. Connect. Arizona Hispanic Connection. Thank you. Thank you so much for staying with us. This is AARP Arizona Hispanic Connection. And we just have a, a few more minutes uh, uh, to go. And it's been a very, very good uh, conversation. I really, really uh, enjoyed it. And uh, I would like to pose the same question again and maybe open it up uh, to each one of us to say, what is the claim that we have to be members of this society? Do we have a claim, Dan? Absolutely, David. Um, our people have been here for over 500 years. And we came initially because uh, Queen uh, Isabella and King um, Ferdinand sent the men from Spain to look for gold. But we quickly found that there were people here that we uh, could intermarry with and form families. And then we moved all over the, the Western Hemisphere and we provided our blood, sweat, and tears to develop farming, ranching, mining, and cities that are, are a rich part of our history, our heritage. So we're here to stay. Awesome. Frank? If you look at a tall building, it has a foundation and a base. 
And that's where you find the contribution of the Mexican community, Mexican-Americans. They not only were here first, but they provided the basis for the growth of everything. They were in agriculture, mining, uh, labor, but they also had businesses going here. They, uh, they were the base for the Southwest. Uh, if, if you go to the East, you find some other bases, but here in the Southwest, that base was the, the, the Latino uh, base that built the, the, all that you see here in the Southwest. And I think that's important to understand, especially for the younger people who seem to think they, they, uh, they were brand new in here. No, no, they've been here since the, uh, before it was part of the United States, and their blood, sweat, and tears is what has made this country what it is. It is a solid base. It's not a weak one, huh? There's a the, the claim has a strong foundation in both the fact that we've been here forever and then the contributions and the successes that we now are enjoying, Al. Yes. Mr. Al, I think it's so important that everyone know there's history. Know your family history because you will see how hard working we have been from the 1600s to the 1700s how we have established and created a society here and that we went on to get involved with the minings and farms mm -hmm. and ranches and we have continued to help. I think the, the real uh, way to celebrate is that our ancestors did all of this work so that we could have a better life. And uh, we need to keep on telling our stories because if we don't tell our stories, then It, like it never happened. So we encourage everyone to write their stories, write about your ancestors coming from, from Mexico, which was, we were in Mexico, you know. So keep on writing those stories and sharing with it. Uh, I just want to end one thing that I took my son to Chicago last summer and we visited museums along the way. And all the museums show that the growth of the United States came from the East and then came west. They did not show anything that happened from coming from Mexico to the southwest. And so if we're not going to be there, hmm. then we're going to get the scraps. Right, we right. need to be telling our stories. Yeah. What's our claim, James? I, I think, Al, that, that's a really uh, your final point there about our story not being included as much as it needs to be in the American story uh, is part of the responsibility that we have here today, particularly writers, people who are documenting our stories. So thank you for the work you do. I, I, you know, the first thing I want to say before we talk about our claim is that uh, is to understand that the First Nations, of course, who were here for at least 20,000 years, and then more recently an archaeologist suggested that uh, Native uh, communities have been here for maybe as long as 150,000 years in this continent. Um, you know, they, of course, were the first peoples. Yes. And it's important to always talk about that because we as our products of both colonialism and uh, the Indian communities. Yes. Uh, and so, you know, I, I like to talk about my Aztec roots, at least in the abstract, uh, <laughs> even if I can't, even if I can't find that, uh, that, you know, that village where it all happened. Uh, but, if, but it's important to think about that because, you know, Picard, because part of our argument here today is that we need to be included in the American story. And so if we're going to be included in the American story and have that expectation, then we need to include uh, every part of our own heritage, which even is, of course, the native uh, communities. Uh, but I think ultimately our claim for me is, um, you know, it's been talked about that in the United States, that through the course of our history, we have been trying to Um, what's the word? Uh, we're, we've been trying to uh, achieve a more perfect union. And what that suggests to me is that, of course, we are far from perfection. This country will never be perfect. But our, our, um, our goal as a democracy is to always try to move in that direction closer and closer in that direction. Uh, and so our claim should be that we are part of that union, right? Just yes. as the Irish War, uh, as they came in through the East Coast, or the Pilgrims War, uh, and so on and so forth. We are part of that, uh, and so we deserve that inclusion because if we really are democracy and we really do believe in pluralism, uh, we're part of that, right? And we, we have an equal standing uh, as compared to all of the groups that have made this country what it is. Yeah. You know, I have to say again that when we selected the issues for this platform, history came like first. 
and because because of this uh, very uh, issue that if we do not know our story, if we do not know our history, if we do not tell our story, then it's going to get lost. Because right. and just by highlighting these amazing facts, uh, you feel that wow, you know, we are part of we're part of this. You know, we're, it's not just like we just like the videos. You know, the first episode on foreigners in their own land says. We're, we did not come day before yesterday, says the, the video, you know. We've been here forever, so I don't know. It, I don't know. It just, it just gives you a, a, a sense of identity, a sense of, of pride, if you will. And, and now it is so critical that our children uh, know and, and, uh, and understand their history. Proud of their history. Yeah, to me, I think uh, the, the biggest claim is I, I'm a, a foreign-born Mexican-American. I was born in Mexico City. I came to the U.S. in 1984, uh, became naturalized citizen in 1993. But I, I didn't come here to get a handout. Right. I came here to be become a better person. I came to get an education in the United States. Uh, I came here to work, to become an active member of society. And that's what our immigrants have been doing for the past probably 500 years. They've been, been part of this society working very hard. We don't want a handout here. We want to work and we want to be part of the society. We want to give back to this country. I love this country and um, uh, I hope that uh, every single immigrant that comes here that respects and loves the country as well. So it's the claim that uh, we, we're here to, to participate and to work hard. And Alex, that is continuing, right? I, I think of the young dreamers in our midst, undocumented, getting educated, starting organizations, contributing to the system. There's a young woman who was a dreamer who is now a member of, of the House of Representatives, Isela Blanc. That's uh, right. She's part of that continuing historical mm -hmm. story, right? And we should we should respect that, not, Absolutely. not be afraid of it. I, I have to mention also the, the first Mexican-American uh, governor of Arizona. Uh, Hello. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, el único, el único, Señor Castro, was undocumented into the United States yeah. and and grew to become governor of the state of Arizona. I think every person needs to know the contributions made by people, even those that are undocumented. My uh, many of my family were undocumented and served in World War II, uh, and and uh, how many died. Uh, uh, protecting this country. And, and Frank, uh, uh, it, perhaps even more significantly, he represented the United States of America to th in three other countries. Right. So yeah. for, uh, okay. Amazing. And, and we will devote one show uh, to honor uh, uh, Governor uh, Raul Castro, so stay tuned. We are uh, just about out of time. And we want to thank you. We want to remind you again, please, please, please visit pbs.org. Uh, forward slash Hispanic, uh, uh, sorry, Latino uh, Americans. And, and, and please also help us to um, uh, like our page That's and right. share the page because we, we feel that we will reach more people through uh, the Facebook page than through radio because Facebook, as you know, it's, it's whatever you are all over the world. So please help us and spread the word, Alex. Uh, Absolutely. How should we end this program? Well, this is the second. We don't want to end it. <laughs> no, we don't want to end this program because it's, it's such rich <laughs> yes. history behind it. But I uh, want to remind everybody about the, uh, the Community Painting Day again, Saturday, May 27th, 9.45 a.m. to noon. And it's uh, on 7th Street between Portland and Roosevelt. Uh, we're going to be doing the community painting there right next to a restaurant, a Mexican restaurant, without saying the name. But uh, please <laughs> join us again Saturday, May 27th. Come finalize the mural. Uh, it's going to be a fun, fun day. Fun and the event. good thing is that they, if they join our uh, Facebook page, we are posting all this information. So if you have joined the page, don't write anything. It'll be there. <laughs> And uh, we want to thank our guests. Uh, uh, so thank you, everyone. We run out of time. Uh, thank you so very much. And we'll be here next week. Take care. Take care.